This week on Arizona Illustrated, The Cannabis Coach, Healing with Weed. They held up a newspaper and it said, medical marijuana, we dare you to research it. Fire baked pizza for the soul. You know, it's happening. We're not gonna stop, we can't stop. Like, this is your dream, you gotta fight for it. And Desert Winds, a memoriam. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Over the decades, it's had many names. Mary Jane, Reefer, Pot, Smoke, Weed, Chronic. It has been demonized and celebrated, and in some states, legalized. But beyond recreational use, there's an increasing belief that medical marijuana can be a viable and reliable alternative to opiates for the relief of pain and anxiety. You have to understand this medicine in order to fully make use of it. There are two critical principles. Number one is strain selection. You have to have the right strains. And number two is the dosage. So if you don't get these two right, you're either too stoned or you're not cutting the pain or you know whatever the symptoms are. So So there's about there's two puffs and I'm already feeling the relaxation. So within seconds. We threw a great medicine out to the state of Arizona, but no one's helping people understand how to use it. And I caught a vision of somebody that could help people that really wanted to use this medicinally, not recreationally. Here? No, here. Just... Right here. Yeah. Right there. I say preventative maintenance is better than... That's exactly it. That's exactly We've been married 62 happy years. Not happy, they're the wonderful. The is a sense of humor. Yeah, we tease a lot, we kid yeah, a lot. We kid a lot. But I'm never going to get better. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Okay, I can live with that. Yeah. Especially because you can live with it. Yeah, I can live with it. So what it's about is making life manageable. Just going to push this little button down quickly, and I'm going to wait for it to turn green. You see, she pulled in some more air after she yeah. put it away. That's, we gotta get it way down here in your deep lung, okay? So it's just a little bit. Now inhale. Now inhale. I'd watch these old people and they had no idea what they were doing. Pull away. Pull away. <laughs> Don't empty it. <laughs> just hold it. Hold, hold, hold. Exhale as you want. How's that? That's why we call ourselves a coach. We can help people re-engage because of what we've been okay. through. Let me see on my neck, click it. Good. That, there's what we, there we go, right there. So it did make a difference here? Yeah. I had all this. Her nurse suggested uh, Bill Meeks, Dorothy Meeks have to start somewhere to get some ideas of what to try and how to try it. Because we wouldn't have any idea. We're not familiar with, uh, with uh, cannabis. It's not a oh, cure-all. No, but, but it's a... Uh, it feels a little better. It, you feel a little more relaxed. The medicine works for you. We just have to be consistent about it. So when the old man says, hey, how about a little more medicine? The answer is yes, okay? Born in Arizona, Safford, moved to Tucson when I was just a little guy. CDO High School, we moved up where I met Dorothy, going to school. I made all city as a high school football player. Had a pro tryout of the Canadian Football League. Decided by about age 21, I was about as broken as you can imagine. I mean, physically, I was a wreck. You know, I started with the Sheriff's Department in 1978. Worked the streets, was with the undercover narcotics team. Worked my way from the streets all the way up to assistant chief. And in 1984, I was in a really bad car wreck on duty. 
back was hurt really bad, but nobody diagnosed it for 20 years. So I went into my doctor. I said, Doc, I can't do this anymore. He said, you're retired. And that was the first time I got a prescription. This is what I took every day of my life just for pain. We came up with a, a nickname for the guy that took that pile. We called him Morphine Bill. And Morphine Bill was a jerk. I'd be in bed 12 to 14 hours a day and then sit on the couch for the rest of the day eating pills. My boys came down from Washington and they said, Dad, this, this has got to stop. I said, what do I do? They held up a newspaper and it said, medical marijuana, we dare you to research it. And I laughed at them. Do you really picture your dad, an ex-cop, a Mormon boy? I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do anything. You really picture me smoking a doobie? <laughs> Have you been here before? Yes. A few times. Okay. So I set out a research project to prove them wrong. I need a quarter of blueberry kush, okay. and then I need one gram of the um, gold label, but I need heavy, heavy indica. I studied and studied and studied, and the more I learned, the more I realized the problem was not with cannabis, it was with my personal biases. And there's the berry. Oh, yeah. Just because our society calls it evil for so many years doesn't make it evil. The, the study shows that it's a very beneficial plant. When they started talking to me about using marijuana, I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, why would I tell my children that that was wrong in the 70s and now I'm going to say it's all right for me now? I was raised in the 60s, so we knew the other side of uh, experimenting with it. A lot of people have an idea that, you know, you do medical marijuana, you walk around like Cheech and Chong. If you do recreational marijuana, you will. <laughs> but medical marijuana is a different thing, a sustainable long-term treatment plan. I've been with Onoxicodone for 30 years, gradually increasing. My primary doctor said, we've got to get you off of this. We've been trying, she'd been trying for several years. A lot of these people are just trying to keep their pain at manageable levels. A lot of our geriatric population are on 20 or more medicines, and that's a problem. Polypharmacy is a big problem. It's not unusual to see Mrs. Jones on 10 milligrams of oxycodone four, to four times a day. It's hard to understand how bad I was before and how depressed. She was just balled up on the sofa, hopelessness, just pure hopelessness because of undaunting pain. I didn't know um, how to go about doing it, so I was really happy to find out there was such a thing as a coach around. I think she would have quit all on her own. On the 6th day of April, I started my program with Bill and Dorothy. I had withdrawal like you wouldn't believe, I mean really bad. And I got through it. It took me a year, but on March 31st of 2018, I took my last oxycodone. I couldn't have done it without the marijuana, and I still forget where I came from. I still have a lot of pain, but nothing like I used to have, nothing like I used to have. And my children and grandchildren are like, wow, Grandma, you look so different than you did last year. <laughs> There's a medical purpose and a medical use for this that can change your life. By and large, it'll be symptom improvement, reduction of pain, reduction of muscle spasms, and improved sleep. I've slept better than I have in my life. I just sleep like a baby when I use this. So let's just keep going the way we're doing. Life has, has really picked up. A lot more conversation between the two of us, where before when you're in pain, you're just in your world and uh, so I don't feel as isolated now. If people ask me today what is the most rewarding thing I've ever done, it's not my police career, it's this. Besides our marriage and our four children, it's the most rewarding thing we've ever done. Nobody's ever shamed us, but you, sometimes you think, you know, maybe that person is as, isn't as friendly as they were before, maybe. You know, people have their biases and I can't do anything to control that. I got 28 grams of flour. I got 280 milliliters of coconut oil. 
our bishop knows, our stake president knows, and they're very supportive because they see what good we're doing to educate people and help them to learn how to use this as a medicine. It is a medicine and we respect it. In 2018, the world that we're talking right now, there is an obvious conflict between federal law and state law. The checkpoint down there, the federal officers are seizing people's medicine, um, and that's wrong. I really seriously think that if the opioid crisis wasn't coming to a head, that this would probably be delayed further. Because again, it's a stigma about something being illegal. I don't understand why it cannot be legalized and why it can't, why you can't get some insurance relief. You know, if it's doing me more good than the oxycodone was doing, I just don't understand why the government feels so strongly about not making it legal. Our daily meals are rituals that we should cherish with family, friends, and loved ones. As Scott Giroux had a dream to create a place for such gatherings, he traveled the world to learn more and experience life. And along the way, he found Anello. The whole point of the pizzeria was to make wholesome good food for people. Part of that is using that natural leaven and having that bread to make it digestible. You gotta make good bread to have a good pizza. Long fermentation times are critical to develop that flavor and develop texture. I don't know how to say it, just, just all these little bubbles boop, 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 popping up. Instead of rushing the dough start to finish in two hours, he'll mix the dough one day, but he won't be using that dough until the following day. And keeping it simple, flour, water, and salt is all you need. The fact that Scotty has trained a little bit in Naples is important because he's in that culture. He really wants to uphold this tradition about how the food should be prepared. He has one cooking vessel, basically. He's using that oven. And that's really the show, too, is once you understand what he's doing, cooking all the foods out of that oven and how you manage an oven once you fire it, and using it extensively for every menu item he has. Two of the three pizzas I have are classics. They've been around forever. A marinara, the margarita, and a, a Bianca, a white pizza. The Bianca, I guess, is my one original pizza. I remember making a list in my apartment in Japan. Things I cherished and the values I wanted out of my life. I'd rather be in an environment with people. The idea of day-to-day -day work and putting in that life routine into something and trying to perfect it and make something wholesome just came back to pizza. He's captured this, this excitement of watching this pizza maker in action and, and how he works the dough and, and how he has efficiency of movement. It's not just a pizza. It becomes a story about the person. For Scotty, he's really dedicated to his craft. I met him at Pizzeria Bianco when he was working up in Phoenix. With all my guys, there's no like, hey, you know, here's lesson number one. There's no booklet you get. There's no, 
table 10 and I'm not really gonna email you like my weekly thoughts. I don't know if I taught him anything, to be honest with you, other than allowing myself to be vulnerable enough so you see what you need to see. Just being around the guy for four years, I mean, it's been amazing. He's inspiring. You're never better than ingredients. Understanding what makes good things good, something that's already great, showing in its best light, and, and trying my best to illuminate them and celebrate them. He's pushed local and organic for sure, and that's definitely been transferred to me. And like supporting the people around you. Hey there. So you got basil and herbs? That's my main thing. This is our Genovese basil. Mm -hmm. And you can see the roots. The freshness is gonna be awesome. I mean, yeah, you can bite into it. It has like texture and juiciness to it already. It's it just... still, still he had an extreme amount of talent already. He understood things. Look at the size of this. Yeah, just pretty. ripping it off, you can Look smell that. it. Look at that. Some of the people that I brought down to Tucson end up loving so much. Scotty was one of those guys that said, hey man, I like to do my own thing. And I'm like, hey, what, you know, that's, if that's your dream, dude, that, that's what you have to follow. And that's how it's gonna get delivered, yeah, huh? it's just gonna like get that. Yeah, delivered, just like that. What I felt mean? welcomed here. I started getting to know the other business owners around here. They're all just so supportive. One piece of advice that I did give him was work where you live instead of living where you work. It's the hardest thing is trying to find a place. And I was scrambling and scrambling trying to find it. This block is what attracted me to this place. The heart of the entire restaurant is coming. Gotta bring the oven through the window. Only way in. Oh, yeah. This is great. I'd like to do this all day. But then sit around and wait to hear approval for a permit. That's going to break someone's back. This is something you can physically do. The reason I went to college was to find out how to open a business. Like, how do people do it? I don't know how do people do it. I graduated in uh, finance and minored in Japanese. I studied abroad in Tokyo. I met Shuko in uh, college when I was 21. It took us a long time to get finally together. So we're all over the world, and we got married, and I convinced her to move out to, to here, basically. Leave Tokyo and, and Japan her home. She made a lot of sacrifices to, to come here. I'm lucky to have her. After Kenzo was born, like, oh, you're gonna have a second? I was like, ah. Oh. Yeah, we are. You know, it's called Anello. This is gonna take a while. Shuko would remind me that, like, you know, it's happening. We're not gonna stop. We can't stop. Like, this is your dream. You gotta, you gotta fight for it. I'm gonna try. You can't go this way because there's something in the way. That feels freaking great. That was terrifying. After my time spent in Japan, I wanted to go find the original pizza and that is in, in Napoli. I flew out there with my bicycle and then I just made this little tour of my bike and ate pizza everywhere. And I would just go to the pizzeria and they would just learn to make dough, how to work an oven. I burned a lot of pizzas. He would just make fun of me all day, telling me like, oh, I'm gonna call it Pizzeria Nero. Oh, look at everything, oh, it's black again. Oh, you burned it. And I was like, oh, it's like, I don't know what to say, it's a guy burned it, yeah. I fell in love with the idea of having that wood-fired oven. Have it here and be a reality. That was a powerful time for me.
Thank you. Yum. My family's definitely helped me do this. Give Uncle Salty a smooch. <laughs> Thanks, brother. Just all the support, you know, being there to talk. If everybody could just hold up their glass for a minute. Yeah, it's important for them to be here, to see this, be a part of it. Thank you for being who you are, and thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. I love you. Thank you. Feels really good. <laughs> uh, I didn't think I'd cry. Angel, here's some basil, buddy. Scotty created a, an environment for him to be really happy. And then when you do that, you're able to serve, you know, your 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 restaurant community. All marinades. I heard a crack. Beautiful. Oh, what's up, babe? Hey, hey. Oh yeah. How long do you take a nap for? Oh, the Japanese culture there was, I really identified with and liked. Being in tune with nature, being nature and life cycles is part of that. Kind of slowing down in a way. There's places around the world that make us feel certain ways. I think it has a journey from Italy to Maybe a little bit I had to offer and through what Japan was able to give him. It really has to come from within. He's taking a few simple ingredients and having just a dramatic effect when it reaches your mouth. Focusing on people and food, and it's about being here in this moment to enjoy what's in front of you. That's incredible. Great, great work. What's your name? Vincent. Vincent? Scott. Nice to meet you. I'll and be back. I can't wait to see you again then. Ciao, Vincent. I want it to be approachable. I want people to welcome here. I want it to belong to Tucson. Somehow it'll work out. We started a life, you know, like a brand new life, and I hope this place is around for a long time so we can raise my boy here. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you see? Oh, bus! There's a bus. Like what you see on Arizona Illustrated? Visit our webpage at azpm.org to watch and share stories from this and previous episodes. And like us on Facebook, where you can watch stories, comment, and share your own story ideas. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram, where we share photos and links about the show and what's happening in our community. Bruce Stoller grew up in New York City where he learned to play the piano as a little boy. In the 60s, after a cross-country bike ride, he found his way to Arizona and never left. Stoller fell in love with the desert and became an important part of the musical community in Tucson. Just weeks ago, he passed away after a nine-month battle with cancer. We were lucky enough to share a part of his musical journey back in August of 2016. My name is Bruce Stoller. I'm a pianist, composer, and flute maker. I was born on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, I learned playing piano from my mom, who was a very fine uh, jazz pianist. And I think I learned everything about piano playing 
before I had a proper teacher. I was in Manhattan School of Music, and uh, it was the 60s. I had a shifting of consciousness and, and a shifting of uh, what my goals were. Uh, and so eventually, I went across the GW Bridge on a bicycle out west and landed in Tucson 57 days later, camping, experiencing the West, and a change internally. In the late 70s, I discovered the flutes uh, on a walk with my then wife. She knew that I loved playing bamboo instruments, and there were no examples of them. And she elbowed me on our afternoon walk and said, why not those? I bet native cultures and Hispanic cultures have done this. In my research at the Science Library and at the main library at the University of Arizona, I found that no records of cylinder making with yucca and agave were left behind by natives or Hispanic cultures. I do know that they used them for other purposes. They used them for ramadas, for corrals, for walking sticks. As a musician, as a pianist, as someone who's always loved flutes and get to make these instruments is a very powerful creative message that affects all parts of my musicianship. I never thought that working with my hands in the dirt, gathering the flutes, making the cylinders, composing music for them, the whole thing, was going to affect me psychologically, spiritually, and artistically. I'm a Jewish guy that came out west. I was looking for something. And making a cylinder from the yuccas and agaves was a high thrill of a lifetime. I fell in love with them because it was a way of finding something original. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.